I hope that what I share with you this afternoon will be useful to you. Um, we're all coming from very different contexts, different uh, churches, uh, uh, different needs, um, different issues that we are perhaps dealing with when it comes to our young people and our youth ministry. Um, I'm coming at this subject from um, the perspective of a practitioner. I've been a youth pastor for, for 25 years, and most of my time I have served in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, um, right over on the edge, in the edge of, of Western Europe. Um, so when I come to this issue, I'm, I'm looking at it through my kind of Western European lens. And I'm coming at it from that experience. So when I talk about these things, you will have to take the principles and contextualize them for you in your country, in your context, in your church, uh, in your ministry. You know your young people best. But many of these issues, I believe, are global. So as we think about young people, the needs of young people today are as important as they have ever been. And when we talk about pastoral care for our teenagers, we're talking about investing in lives. It's investing in lives. It's a relationally driven ministry. We'll come to that in a moment. Because the truth is the shape of our society tomorrow is going to depend to a large extent on how we relate to the young people that we have in our youth ministries, young people in our communities today. And pastoral care is something that we're all involved in as we work with our teenagers. And as we think about what pastoral care is, this is perhaps a really useful definition. Um, helping young people to come to a place where they're actively enjoying and experiencing abundant life. Drawn from a living relationship with Christ as Savior and Lord. The church that I work in in, in Belfast, the, our, our Bible verse, which is kind of our mission verse for our church, is John chapter 10, verse 10. And we know that verse where Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. We want our young people to experience that life. And to experience that life, they've got to experience Jesus. They've got to know Jesus because he is the abundant life. And from that living relationship with Jesus, their identity then is formed and shaped. And when we think about young people, when we think about all human beings, the Psalms are very, very clear. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I praise you for I am fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows this very well. As we think about how we care for our young people, how we minister to our young people, we've got to come at that from, from a whole person perspective. These young people are complex. They're wonderfully made and knit together. And uh, as they grow, they don't just grow spiritually in our ministries, they also grow physically. They're growing socially. They're growing intellectually. They're growing emotionally. And there's a lovely verse from the Gospels, from Luke's Gospel, right at the end of Luke chapter 2. And it just follows that incident when Jesus and his family and the whole community had been up in Jerusalem and they, had, they were on their way back. They were on their way back home when Jesus' parents realized that Jesus isn't with the other kids in the community. And they look for Jesus and they can't find him. So they have to backtrack. They go back up to Jerusalem. And there they find Jesus in the temple courts. And he's with the teachers. And they're amazed at his knowledge. And then they bring Jesus back home. And there's this lovely verse that says, And Jesus increased in wisdom. Jesus increased in wisdom. And he's growing socially 
with man. He's growing in his relationships with others in his community. And as we work with young people, I think our aim in pastoral care is to see them thrive and not merely survive in life. We want them to experience abundant life flowing from that relationship with Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. And as we do that, that's inevitably going to involve providing support. It's going to involve providing encouragement and counsel for young people. As they encounter the challenges, as they encounter crisis, as they discover problems, and as they have questions, and as they wrestle with doubts in their lives. So we've got to minister to the whole person. God has created them wonderfully complex with all these needs. And in our pastoral care, that's going to involve often this immediate aim of providing advice, providing support, coming alongside them in a supportive capacity, and also providing encouragement. Encouragement has been sometimes referred to as oxygen for the soul. I like that description of it. Affirmation, encouragement, and counsel. Godly counsel when they're facing some of those challenges and some of those problems and some of those questions. And pastoral care is something we're all already involved in and something we have to prioritize in our youth ministry. And I want to start with the caring relationship. Before we look at some of the issues and some of the areas in a young person's life where pastoral care is needed, I think it's important that we start with the relationship and get some context for that. Robert Putman's book, Bowling Alone, popularized a phrase, and the phrase was social capital. Social capital, where human resources are invested in a person, in you and I, without a self-serving agenda. Social capital. So think of one person, you know, outside of your parents who cared deeply about you and made sure you knew that you mattered, that you were significant, that you were special. Those people are social capital. And they're essential for young people becoming adults. So what's happened in the world of young people? Well, I think it's certainly true in the West. You'll have to think about it for your context, where you're coming from. But let's, for example, think about teachers. If we ask teachers 30 years ago, we talked to a teacher 30 years ago, and we asked them the question, what do you teach? I would suggest they would probably say, I teach students. I teach young people. But I would surmise that if we ask teachers today, what do you teach? In 2018, in the 21st century, I would say they would reply, I teach physics, or I teach mathematics, or I teach English. If we talked to a coach 30 years ago and we asked them, what do you do? They might say, I coach kids. I coach young people. And now they might say, well, I coach football or soccer or floorball or rugby. See, the joy of giving yourself away to a child, to a young person, has been eroded. And this has changed exponentially today from the 1980s. So it's very, very difficult for young people today to build and to identify an adult who will build into their lives, who will invest in them in this way. Because today, everyone has got an agenda, some kind of expectation. 
No longer, we might suggest, the teachers want to make great people. Now they want to make great students. And that's not to say that we don't want our students to achieve. Of course we do. But we don't want to see their intellectual development, and their academic development, at the expense of their emotional development, their physical development, their social development, their spiritual development. So relationship is essential. Relationships are the fuel on which youth ministry travels. So said Pete Ward, theologian and pioneer in youth ministry in the United Kingdom. And he's right. Youth ministry is the essential currency of relationships or the essential currency of youth ministry. And everything we do in youth ministry should be relationally driven. In youth ministry, those of us who are involved in that, that's our calling, that's our role. We don't do it to run programs, though we run programs. And we want those programs to be excellent. We want those programs to be engaging and creative. But we run those programs to give structure to the relationships that are being built with the teenagers, with the young people who come along. Effective youth ministry is relationally driven. We've already acknowledged, though, that there is a lack of social capital in society around the world today. And in the, in the 1980s, in the late 1980s, studies, studies showed that young people were hurting more than ever in the United States. There were doubling divorce rates, increased suicide rates. Um, and in 1989, the Carnegie Institute attempted to understand why the young people of the 1980s were less stable than their counterparts from the 60s. And they came up with two conclusions. The first one was this, that the ongoing support, adult support and guidance offered to young people had decreased at a significant rate. There was less and less adult involvement, adults other than parents, and it's often parent, parents too, less adult involvement in the lives of young people. While at the same time, as adult support was decreasing, the skills that were needed to reach adulthood had risen at the same rate. It was more and more difficult for young people to enter society, as we might think of fully formed, rounded adults. The skills needed now in the 21st century for young people to enter society and play that role and have those responsibilities has never been higher. But adult involvement in their lives, investing in their lives, has never been lower. And uh, Dr. James Comer from Yale University commented, these two trends have created a serious problem in our country. He's speaking of the United States. He said, indeed, a crisis. And I think we see that. I see, certainly see that in, in my context. Um, and I think we see that globally all over the world. Young people are desperate. They're looking for role models. They're longing for people who will invest in them, who will help them answer the questions that they have, who will set before them an example that's worth following, who will provide support 
who will mentor them, who will pass on life skills. They're longing for it, but in a lot of the time, those people are absent from their lives. So if we are to provide this kind of relationship, what's going to be required? The first thing I would say is it's going to require intentionality. It's going to require intentionality on our part. It's got to be purposeful. Targeted. And that's going to mean from you and I, as we build relationships with young people, we've got to be curious and we've got to ask questions. This is how we can be intentional. We be curious and we ask lots of questions. We find out what's going on in their lives. We find out what makes them tick, to use that expression. What they're excited about. What they're facing. We get to know them. So be curious and ask lots of questions. And be interested in their lives. Find out from those young people, perhaps that are in your church or in your ministry, find out about what things they do, they're involved in, that they can teach you about. Things that you know nothing about. I had this kid in my youth club. He was a young teenager, probably about 15 years old. And he played the bagpipes. You know, like the Scottish bagpipes. Have you ever heard the bagpipes? And I was curious. I had known nothing about, thankfully, nothing about bagpipes. Apologies to our Scottish friends. But I'm curious. I'm like, how did you get started? Do your neighbors like you? And he wasn't just a, a bagpipe player. He was a champion. He was a world champion at playing the bagpipes in his age group. And he schooled me. I learned a lot about the bagpipes. But more than that, here was a young person who after that conversation looked at me and recognized here, here was someone who took an interest in his life. Took an interest in a part of his life. Um, and wanted to know about that. And in wanting to know about that, wanted to know about him. It's a very, very simple example. So be curious. Ask lots of questions. Follow up on significant conversations. That's so important. And as, long, as well as, as, as being curious and asking questions, practice hospitality. Be generous with your life. Involve young people in your everyday life. Let normal activities with you, with your family, become unique opportunities for connecting with young people. One of the things that in my family, my wife and I love to do is to have young people come to our home for dinner. Because for many of them, they never sit down with a family to have dinner around the table. And that's a significant event. To model these practices and these healthy, life-giving family practices with them. Be generous with your life. Practice hospitality. Laugh together. Laugh together. Find opportunities to laugh. Who here likes to have fun? I sure hope so. I sure hope so. You don't laugh with your enemies. Do you? Of course you don't. You laugh with your friends. You laugh with your friends. Laughter is a leveler. It breaks down barriers. Create opportunities to laugh together and to solidify relationships. And another key point as well is pray together. Praying together. Strengthening bonds. So as you're intentional, those are just some simple suggestions. Be curious. Ask questions. Follow up on significant conversations. If someone has shared something with you, follow up on that. If you've been talking to a young person and maybe they're, they've, they've disclosed that they're concerned about a test that they have to take, some significant event that's going on or coming up in their lives, the next time you see them, 
Remind them about that. Talk to them about that again. How did that go? Send them a message. Say, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking of you. I'm remembering you. It communicates value. It communicates love. Be generous with your life. Practice hospitality. Laugh together. Pray together. Be intentional. The other thing that I think is important for us to do is to understand youth culture. To understand youth culture. And in this sense, we can think of culture, and, and this is a great definition by Andy Hickford. Culture is experienced more readily than it can be described. It is the air we breathe. It is the water we swim in. It's everything about our background and environment which shapes the people we are. Culture is the air we breathe. It's the water we swim in. It's the environment which shapes the people that we are. And when we think about youth culture, we're thinking about something which is really one global subculture. Great. One global subculture. And, uh, and I'm sure if I sat down with your teenagers, wherever you serve, and I talked to them about what they were listening to or what they were watching, many of those things would be exactly the same as the teenagers that I, that I spent my time with in, in Belfast. They're watching the same movies. They're watching the same YouTube videos. They're listening to the same songs, right? It's this global culture and it's expressed and it's contained in and it's more than music, movies, videos, teen magazines, advertising, the internet, TV. But it's incredibly powerful. And I wanna pause for a moment and think about the significance of this and the influence of popular culture, particularly the media, on young people over the world. Because media not only reflects, it also shapes culture. It reflects culture, but it also shapes culture. And Ben Okri, who's an African author, once um, wrote these words. He said, stories are the secret reservoir of values that individuals and nations live by and tell themselves. Change the stories and you change the individuals and nations. That's a powerful thought. Stories are the secret reservoir of values that individuals and nations live by. What are the stories that young people are living by? They're the three minute rap songs and pop songs that they're listening to in their earbuds on their smartphone. They're the YouTube videos that they're watching, the YouTube stars that they're following. They're the magazines that they're reading. They're the TV shows that they're binging on on Netflix. They're the secret reservoir of values that are shaping their principles, shaping their lives. It's both reflecting culture, but it's also shaping it. And some of those stories are heartbreaking. Some of those stories are destructive. And the good news is, brothers and sisters, don't we have a better story? Don't we have a better story to share? Because if we change the stories, we change individuals who change nations. So we have to be cognizant of what they're listening to, what they're watching, because it sets standards. It prevents unchallenged norms in a moral vacuum. The world that they're living in today. And it creates an image. Youth culture creates an image. The ideal image that's sold to young people. So fashion and the illusion of beauty communicates this idea that worth is measured by what you own, by how you look and what you do rather than your identity as an individual created in the image of God. A 
I'll say more about that in a moment or two. The media also exploits. It exploits young people. When we think of this particularly in the area, this realm of how sex is used to sell everything. From deodorant to razor blades to fashion to cars to drinks. You name it. It's a sexualized society. But let's all let's not all be negative because the media can also entertain. Many of us enjoy it. It entertains. It can be positive. And it can also be negative. People can amuse themselves to death. What we've got to teach our young people is how to watch the media and listen to the media with their eyes and their ears open. And to critique it through scripture. So when they watch those shows on Netflix, that they don't just absorb it like a sponge, but that they question it. I love how in the Gospels you see Jesus and he would often say, you've heard it said, but I tell you. You've read that? You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I tell you. We've got to start practicing that with our teenagers. Hey, you've heard it said on this song. You've heard it said on this TV show that this is what you should do. But Jesus tells you something different. We've got to be aware of how youth culture is impacting and shaping young people. And that's a whole other seminar that I don't have time to do this afternoon. So let's move on. We have intentionality. We have understanding youth culture and the importance of time. The importance of time. If we're going to be effective in pastoral care and investing in the lives of teenagers, it's going to require time. And the reality is that you only get 24 hours in the day. You only get seven days in the week. Um, You can't make time. You can't make time to invest in people. You have to take time to invest in people. You have to take time sometimes from other things. And this is where we've got to work strategically, work smart, to ensure that our young people in our ministries, particularly where maybe those ministries are large, have Adults, leaders in their lives who are consistently devoting their time, taking time to invest in them. I'm more and more convinced in in youth ministry. It's not enough for young people to see their leaders just at the youth group and then they don't see them again until the next week that they come to church or to the youth group. What happens is that Christians become phantom Christians. They kind of float in and out of their lives. um, And they're absent from their lives the rest of the time. We've got to get creative about how we can be present in their lives. And in a world of social media, there are many more options that we have to do that. As long as we set good boundaries and good practice in place when we do those things. It's going to also require listening. It's going to require listening. Listening is a basic prerequisite in all pastoral conversations that we have with young people. It's demanding. And one difficulty can be that very often we all think we know how to listen. But in many normal conversations that we have with people, things distract us from listening to what the other person is saying. We may be thinking about what we're going to say next in response Um, We want to get in with our own story. We get distracted by other things that are going on. But when a person trusts us, particularly when they trust us with their problems, we need to be able to put down our own worries and concerns and listen. Listen with the intent of understanding. And that's going to involve more than just giving passive or half-hearted notice to the words that come from another person. It's going to involve 
setting aside your own biases and preoccupations so that you can concentrate on what that person is communicating to you. It's going to, avoid, it's going to involve us avoiding subtle verbal or nonverbal expressions of disapproval. If someone is sharing something with us and, and, and we find it offensive or we don't agree with it. We've got to use both our eyes and our ears when we're ministering to young people to detect messages that come, come from the tone of their voice and from their posture, from their gestures, from their facial expressions or other nonverbal clues. Hearing is not only what a person says, but it's what a person leaves out from what they say. So we've got to learn to listen well and develop that skill. And isn't it true that, you know, we think about it, we're, we're taught how to speak, we're taught how to read, we're taught how to write, but we're never taught how to listen. And that's, that's something we can all become more effective at and invest in that skill. Well, when we put all that together, what do we get? I think what happens is that we create an environment for growth. I was reading recently about uh, greenhouses in harsh climates, arctic conditions, where they can build these greenhouses and outside it's freezing, it's 40 below. The ground is frozen hard, much too hard for crops to be planted. But in these large industrial sized greenhouses, they can plant the crops. They can create the environment that's conducive to growth. Outside is harsh and unrelenting, but inside it's designed for growth and for change. And our job is to provide this essential relational environment as we minister to young people. To provide a different soil and a different climate so that a person can begin to flourish as the unique individual he or she actually is. That's a great gift that we can give our young people. And for us as leaders, for, for you as maybe youth leaders or as pastors or as parents, that is going to involve time and listening and understanding where they're coming from and what's shaping their lives and intentionality. And it's going to involve also on our part, that we be congruent as people, that we be authentic, that we give them the gift of unconditional positive regard, that we ensure that young person feels prized and valued, and that we give them empathy, that we could communicate to them we understand what's going on in their lives. So that's the caring relationship. The teen world, the world that young people are in today. I mean, think of it in this way. I've, I've heard it described like a corridor, like childhood is like a long corridor and there are all these doors going off that corridor. And perhaps in childhood, those doors are locked. But when they get to adolescence, all those doors are open. And there's all these different options and choices they face as they walk down the corridor of adolescent development as they're growing in their lives. Things that previously were shut off to them, closed off to them, are now wide open, enticing them to come in. So we have this increased access to, to unlock doors. And issues, for example, like self-harm, where we have young people dealing with this, the, 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 the challenges and reality of stress and anxiety and looking for coping mechanisms and sometimes finding these coping mechanisms and destructive coping mechanisms like self-harm. So a big question for us in our ministry is do we teach our teenagers to deal with stress well? Do we ensure that there are protective factors in place in their lives to help them cope with the challenges of the modern world that we're in today.
Do we help them to maintain emotional health and well-being? I believe that in our youth ministries, if we're not teaching about these things, we're failing our young people. We're failing our young people. Um, just this last week, in fact, last week and on Sunday night past in, in my youth group, my young people were exploring the topic of emotional well-being. We were looking at it from a biblical perspective. We wanted to talk about this issue and to say to them, guys, Jesus has something to say about this. The scriptures have got something to say about this issue that you are dealing with, that you're living with, that your friends are dealing with. How do we respond to it? What knowledge and skills can we give you to help you cultivate emotional health and well-being? Are you with me? Is this making sense? Is this helpful? It's a lot of talking for me. But we'll keep going, all right? Stress and pressure. Stressed generation. Um, uh, some have said the, the most stressed generation. Not to say that generations before haven't dealt with stress, but there's something about our modern world that seems to be increasing the levels of stress that young people are living with and dealing with. And I'll, I'll mention more about that in a moment or two. And then, of course, we have the internet and social networking. The proliferation of social media, social networking, has created all kinds of problems. It's an increasingly complex social world that young people are living in. The research and the investigations and the studies that are ongoing are actually showing that social media is actually rewiring teenagers' brains and how they think. Alongside that, we have the risk and the reality of fake relationships. And the problems that that creates, the risk that that creates for young people. But there's also for themselves where they can have oneself online that's a very different self from the young person in the real world. Does that make sense? Fake relationships. And then, of course, the breakdown of privacy. We're in the world now where what is private is now public. I once watched a young person from my youth ministry have an argument with his mom on Facebook. I mean, I guess he was probably in his bedroom somewhere on a computer and she was maybe downstairs in the kitchen or the living room on a computer. And they're having this, you know, he would post something, she would post something, and he would post something. And it was this full-blown full argument on, on Facebook. And then all their young people would chip in and they'd be like, that was a little harsh what you said right there, you know. And it was this something that, was, that should have been private was all out there in the world. We have this breakdown of privacy. And then, as I alluded to earlier, there is the, the myth of perfection. The myth of perfection. Young people in the world today are told that they have to look perfect, they have to act perfect, they have to be perfect. The culture sells this illusion of perfection everywhere. The scriptures say, to all perfection I see a limit. There's only one who's perfect. And that's God. But what incredible pressure is being placed on young people in the world today. I remember one of my daughters coming home from school and she was, she was talking about uh, another uh, girl in the class who was upset that day because she'd got a result from a test. She'd got 80%. She was upset. She was scared to go home. And I said to my daughter, why was she scared to go home? 80%? If I got 80% in anything, I'd put it on the wall and frame it. <laughs> she said, well, last week she got 95. And she was scared to go home and say that she got 80% because it would be a disappointment. 
What are we doing to our kids? That 80% is never enough. There's something about our world that causes these problems. So we, we've talked about um, the, the, the importance of the relationship. We've talked about the world of the teenager. And let's very briefly comment on needs. Because needs of teenagers are something that we also have to be aware of in pastoral care relationships. And uh, Maya Kelmer Pringle, in her writings, many, many years ago, she proposed that young people have these six significant needs. The need for love and security. And it's probably the most important need as it provides the basis for all later relationships in their lives. On it depends the development of their personality. The ability to care and the ability to respond to affection and to love. A continuous, reliable, loving relationship with their family and then with a growing number of others. Those things can help meet that need. Love and security gives a young person a sense of worthwhileness. And then, of course, there's the need for new experiences. That's a requirement, a fundamental requirement for their mental growth. In early years, in, in little children, that comes through play. And as they get older, they, they need those new experiences to stretch them, to challenge them. Growth does not reside in a place called comfortable. So we have to find ways that we can take our young people out of their comfort zones into the unknown, where they can be stretched, new experiences, where they can grow. Um, praise and recognition. They need praise and recognition. It requires, growing up requires a tremendous amount of care and uh, the most in effective incentives as young people grow and face the challenges that they face are praise and recognition sustained over a period of time. And I, I, one of the things I would say in our youth ministries is we've got to be careful not to assume that praise and recognition is being heard and being felt by our young people. Uh, we've got to put individuals and names on it, ensure that it's communicated. And they require they need responsibility as well. They need responsibility. So they can gain independence. Where they can take on rules. And as I think about this some questions that we might surmise for those of us in youth ministry, for those of us in, in the church is, what are we doing as a youth ministry or as a church to intentionally communicate love to young people? What are we doing to provide significant new experiences for them that will stretch them, that will enable them to grow? What are we actively doing to nurture a culture of, a, a culture of encouragement for our teenagers? And what are we doing to ensure that young people are given the opportunity to grow in responsibility? Tapping into their enthusiasm. Yeah, for sure they're going to make mistakes. They're going to blow it. It's not going to go well all the time. But those are great opportunities for learning when we make it explicit. And if that relationship is alongside it, it's incredibly powerful. So, as we pull all this together then, what are the areas of a young person's life where pastoral care is needed? So, I'm going to highlight a few that, that Simon Gibson, um, in a book, Pastoral Care for Young People, has highlighted. He's, he's talked about um, a number of areas where pastoral care is required. So, the first one we, is, is spiritual care, the need for spiritual care. Care which relates to the faith of a young person. And of course, in the church, in Christian ministry, we want to see those we are responsible for, those, those young people that we work with. We want to see them know Jesus, 
We want to see them grow in those relationships with Jesus. And we want to see them show Jesus to the world. We want to see them equipped that they can be disciple makers amongst their peers. That they can be catalysts for change in their generation, uh, in their world. So we want them to, to develop a relationship with God. And we want to them to grow in their understanding and in their knowledge of God and of the Christian faith. And at the heart of true spiritual care lies this awareness of the fact that they have deep inner needs. Those needs for love, those needs for significance, and for meaning that we've already mentioned. So we present Jesus to these kids and we work as hard as we can praying for their salvation, for their sanctification, that they look more like Jesus in their character and they act more like Jesus in their priorities. And we long to see them grow and develop a mature faith, an adult faith, the kind of faith that Ephesians 4 talks about. Where they're not going to be blown about by the ideologies and the ideas and the lies that they're faced with in this modern world. So there's a need for spiritual care. There's also a need for motivational care. Young people are, as all human beings are, motivational beings who act and who pursue plans and they pursue aims and they pursue goals. And we have to provide motivational care. We have to be aware of what motivates them. And we have to help them think through what are their goals in life? What are they living for? What are their objectives? What are their coping mechanisms? What are their survival strategies that they're using? And we help them become spiritually mature so that they might progressively follow the will of God for their lives. I think one thing that's really good to get a hold of as we think about providing motion, motivational care is understanding right from the outset that young people are not like adults. They don't think like adults. And... Uh, they're in this journey of transition. If I could sum up the, the teenage years in one word, I would use the word transition. They're changing. And it's almost as though the culture hits the pause button and they get this space to figure out some big questions in life. So when G. Stanley Hall first coined the phrase adolescence, way back in 1900, in the early 1900s. Um, he looked at adolescent development as a period of about 18 months from childhood to adulthood. Like an 18 month window for you know, children to transition to become an adult with adult responsibilities. And here we are in 2018, and adolescence begins in puberty, begins in biology, it ends in culture, which means that adolescence now extends right into the mid-20s. And maybe even beyond. There's lots of 30-year-olds who are sitting around in their bedroom playing Xbox. All right? So adolescence today is, is a, a process of many, many years. People are trying to figure out some tasks, three basic tasks. The question of identity. Who am I in the world? Who am I in the world? Who am I? The question of autonomy. How am I unique and different? Do I have power? What's my unique contribution? Do I matter? Can I make a difference? Can I exert influence? And then this third question, this question of affinity. Where do I belong and to whom do I belong? How do I relate to others? And of course, as believers, we see identity as a theological term. And your team's quest for identity is all about living up to the norm in the world around them. But God's understanding of identity is rooted in creation. 
It's rooted in redemption. It's rooted in calling. So before the foundation of the earth, God knew our teenagers. And he loved them and he called them very good. And they were created theologically on the sixth day as a human being in his image. So the gospel says we don't need to go looking for who we are, but to discover who we are to discover because God has called us his child. It's not about who am I, it's whose am I. That's what shapes and ultimately defines our identity. Our job then as adults, as leaders, is to help them to discover who this amazing person is. So they're motivated often by these tasks. And a lot of the things that we see young people do, and a lot of the mistakes that they made, and a lot of the negative behavior that sometimes they demonstrate and display is because they're struggling to accomplish these tasks. And they're not making a great job of it. So one of the things I think we need to do is we need to be patient. And we need to have understanding. And we need to have empathy. My mom used to say to me, maybe it, it happened in, in your, your culture, in your language, but my mom used to say to me when I did something stupid, something foolish, she would say, Paul, act your age. Act your age. And I was. She just didn't realize it. I was 14 and I was doing what 14 year olds do. Stupid stuff. Not thinking through the consequences of my choices. Not realizing that if I do this, it's going to result in this. I wasn't able to foresee that. So I was acting my age. Um, and here's the thing now today in the world that we're in. All of us in the room, we were a teenager once. There was a point in my life when I was 16. It's a long time ago. Youth ministry did this much damage to me. Right? I was 16 once. But I was never their age. You were 16 once. But you were never 16 in 2018. So what we've got to do, those of us who are older and more mature, and who've lived a little longer, whenever we see young people make those mistakes, we've got to really resist that urge to go, well, in my day, I know what it's like. No, you don't. No, I don't. Because we were never their age in the world today. So we've got to be empathetic to what's going on in their lives. And... Uh, be patient with them as they resolve these tasks. That's a huge part of pastoral care, that sense of understanding. There's then the need also for cognitive care. The need for cognitive care. And this relates to the mind and to the thinking of a young person. So through the caring process, we help them understand how they think, what they're thinking, and how their thoughts have an impact uh, on, their, on, their, on their choices and um, particularly helping them to identify when thoughts are wrong, when they're unhealthy. Because thoughts influence emotions, thoughts influence actions. And we've got to help them to think biblically about their choices and their goals and what they're aiming for in life. And we've got to help them to be able to identify when they encounter um, unhealthy choices, when they encounter lies, uh, unhealthy thoughts, and when they encounter um, destructive thoughts. And one of the things that, that, that I've been talking to my teenagers about is when, whenever they're thinking about something, um, think of it like a ball that you catch. You catch that thought and examine it. 
Is it, is it a, is it a helpful thought? Is it true? If it is, keep it. But if you can identify it as being unhelpful, as being unhealthy, then you've got to reject it. And you've got to replace it with something truthful and good. So for a young person who's struggling, for example, with the thought of, I'm worthless. I'm worthless. If I wasn't here, I remember a young person in my youth group one time said to me, one night he looked really down and I went to him and I said, what's wrong? And he said, I don't think if I was here, I said, I think, he th if, I was, if I wasn't here, I don't think anybody would miss me. I has one of the saddest things I ever heard a teenager say. If I wasn't here, I don't think anybody would miss me. That's an unhealthy thought. You gotta catch it, reject it, replace it with something else. What's the scripture say? We know. The scripture says, you're of great worth. You're worth Jesus to God because that's the price he paid for you. The value he places on your life is equal to the value that he places on the life of his beloved son. Because he gave him so that all might believe and all might have everlasting life. So we've got to teach our young people to think biblically. Um, I'm rushing through these areas, but there's, this is important to you. There's the need for cognitive care, and that's connected to, to this one, the need for emotional care as we think about our pastoral care with teenagers. Feelings play a really important part in our lives. They influence our thoughts, vice versa, our decisions, our actions, and they also kind of stimulate further emotions within us. And so what we have to do with our young people is provide care which involves helping them face their feelings, identify their feelings. And to understand why they feel the way they do about whatever it is that's going on. And then discover constructive emotions that result from a Christ-centered life that we find in Galatians 5. And we could think of very commonly experienced and frequently experienced emotions that young people face like anxiety, guilt, fear, anger, sadness. Um, feelings are, are not random. Feelings are always about something. Emotions are always about something. And what we have to do is help them cultivate and nurture emotional intelligence. It's one of the great gifts that we can give our young people, and they need it desperately in this modern world. So it's important to take note of our feelings instead of ignoring them because it's who it's part of who God has created them it's part of who God has created all of us to be so our emotions can help us grow our sense of self-worth emotions are how we know that we're taking care of ourselves or how we know when we're not taking care of ourselves so think of the example of a referee on the football pitch the soccer pitch blowing the whistle when he blows the whistle, it's blown to flag up an issue. So emotions act like that. They help us navigate through difficult times. And if we can name them, we can begin to work with them, identify them, and understand them. And of course, this brings us on to some of the, the, this, the emotions that, that young people are really faced with today. And I've, I've mentioned, I've alluded to this already in the early part of this presentation. But the issue of stress and anxiety issue of stress and anxiety. I've looked at some research and again these are figures that are related to the United Kingdom um, and to my part of the world. You'll have to dig into those figures for your context wherever you are. But some of the things that, that have startled me and have caused me to really, I think should cause us all to pause and consider the reality that, of what our teenagers are facing is that rates of anxiety and depression 
in young people have increased by over 70% over the past 25 years. That's a sobering statistic. Would you agree? Rates of anxiety and depression increasing by over 70%. Um, in the United Kingdom, that means one in 10 teenagers have a mental health problem. One in 10, which is about three in every classroom. Half of the problems with mental health issues start before the age of 14 with young people. 45% 40, of young people feel anxious about their body image, how they look, identity, how they're seen. 37% worry about schoolwork, the pressure of academic achievement. Research suggests that young people who are heavy users of social media, spending more than two hours per day on social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are more likely to report poor mental health. They did a study looking at five social media platforms. Instagram came out as the one that caused the most anxiety amongst teenagers. In my little part of the world, Northern Ireland, wonderful place. A little corner of the United Kingdom. A recent research by the Princess Trust charity discovered this. 44% of young people in Northern Ireland say they have experienced a mental health problem. This was the one that grabbed me. 68% reveal they always or often feel stressed. Way over half of our teenagers always or often feel stressed. 60% said they always or often feel anxious. 33% reported they always or often feel hopeless. And I think that's tragic. 25% think they put too much pressure on themselves to achieve success. And all this culminates in, uh, for the UK, British teens have the second lowest mental well-being out of 20 major countries. We have a, a serious problem, a serious issue that uh, in the church we really have to face up to and deal with. And we have the good news, and we have the resources, and we have the hope to give to these young people and these old adults who are dealing with these issues as well. Well, what is it about the teenage years that um, I think be perhaps make it more stressful um, and make it more anxious? And I, I think there's a couple of things just to bear note of as we come to the end of this. There's the stages of life that they're at. There's some significant things that are happening at this stage of life. There's a lot of exams. A lot of exams are taking place. There's a greater knowledge of the world. The world in 2018 is a very small place. And we experienced that this week at European Leadership Forum, don't we? Um, and it's wonder. But the world's a small place. I mean, you can, in real time, Talk to and look at your friend on the other side of the world and you, you never have to leave your back garden. You don't have to write a letter and wait a month for it to be delivered and another one to come back. We could talk instantaneously. Oh, there's a greater knowledge of the world and there's a greater knowledge and awareness of the problems in the world as well. Young, this generation of young people are growing up and we heard the other night from, from Amy as she challenged us about reaching the next generation. 
that this is a, a generation of young people who are living in a world where terror is everywhere, where fear is everywhere. And that certainly feeds into that stress, I think, and that anxiety. There's a pressure to conform, to fit in, to be like everybody else. And they're dealing with that, who am I? How am I different from everybody else? But then, how do I belong to everybody else as well? And there's the changing body. Their body is changing. Their body is developing physically. There's the fear of the future. They're dealing with the sad things in their lives often um, or their friends' lives for the very, very first time. In those teenage years, they're perhaps encountering death maybe for the first time. And then there's the state of brain. There's the state of their brain. Because there are factors that, um, some brain factors affect stress in teenagers. They, their ability to make decisions is not developed like an adult's, as I mentioned. They can't foresee the consequences of the choices that they make. They find it hard to control their emotions. When they're a little kid, they've got you know, primary colors on their emotional palette. And then when they have teenage years, they get this all these new palette of colors to play with, and they've got a huge, big, dollop of black to play with as well. So they get all these new emotions to, to paint with in their life. And they're learning to use them. Uh, they get embarrassed about things. They have sleep problems. There's lots of things connected to the change of their brain. They don't make decisions like adults. They can't explore options. They lack the knowledge. They can't consider the consequences. They're more influenced by emotions than adults are. And they misperceive the levels of risk involved in things and end up perhaps finding themselves in difficult situations. Time has almost gone. Time has gone. But let me wrap up by, by quickly just mentioning the last few of these areas. There's the need for relational care. Um, young people need relationships. They need friendships. They need places where those friendships can be formed. Healthy relationships with their peers, with other caring adults. God created human beings with a hunger for relationships, for a relationship with himself and with other people. We have an opportunity to provide that in our churches, in our youth ministries. We can create environments where authentic community can take place. There's also a need for, for behavior and health care. We can help young people think through their behavior when they can face up to their mistakes and learn from them and help them develop better mechanisms for, for coping with the needs that drive those, those behaviors. I remember I had a young person in our youth group who was um, incredibly angry. He, was, he would fly off the handle. Um, he would be aggressive. Um, he would uh, be very volatile. And one night I talked to him um, and uh, discovered that what he'd been dealing with was a family member who was seriously ill. So this young, young man's behavior was being driven by his worry and his, his concern and his emotions over what was going on in his home and in his family. And the last one, very quickly to mention, is the need for material and financial care. Our caring responsibility as Christians goes beyond the spiritual needs of a young person. It includes not just a concern for their physical development and their psychological development and their spiritual development, their relational needs. It's got to include also a commitment to providing their material needs and whatever support is necessary for them as they grow. 
This is why pastoral care is so important in the lives of our young people today. Young people are walking a tightrope of adolescence. Making that journey from dependence to interdependence. Trying to figure out who they are in the world. What does every young person need? Chuck Clark's referred to it as the tightrope of adolescence. And what every young person in the world needs as they make this journey from childhood to adulthood is they need the safety net of support beneath the tightrope. And we can provide that safety net for them as we provide those relationships, those intentional relationships where we communicate care, where we communicate love, where we listen, where we give them time, where we pray for them, where we seek to see the Lord transform their lives and see them not just survive but thrive as followers of Jesus in the world. Lord God, uh, we've spent a little bit of time this afternoon thinking about pastoral care for our teenagers. We've thought about the world that they are in. We've thought about the, the needs that they have. We've thought about the challenges and the issues that they're facing today. Thinking particularly of those issues related to their emotional health and their emotional well-being. And our heart breaks for our young people, Lord. The young people in our churches and in our youth ministries, but also those young people beyond the walls of our churches, in our communities, in our cities, our towns, our nations, who are without hope and without Christ in the world, who are longing for love, who are longing for belonging, who crave new experiences, praise and recognition. And responsibility. And we thank you that in the church we can provide and meet these needs. Help us to do that. Help us to be men and women who listen, who empathize, who affirm, who direct young people to the help that they need, who enlist others in that process of care. And when we need to, on those occasions when it's very serious, where we can refer them on to specialists who can provide the care that's so desperately needed. Thank you for our teenagers. Help us to build those relationships. Help us to see their lives transformed. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.